this Ignatian year. I'm very excited to begin uh, this this process, this conversation. And uh, my name is Sean Bray, and I am the um, Assistant Vice President for Mission here at Loyola University, Maryland. And my name is Paola Pascual Ferra, and I'm Associate Professor of Communication at Loyola, Maryland. So, um, Paula, do you want to talk about, um, uh, you know, as we begin, I think it's important that we actually frame what is the Ignatian year? What, you know, where did we come up with this title? Where did this, did we just pull this out of thin air? Is this something we created? Or, but it's probably helpful to give some context. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll address that. So it's, um, we are celebrating starting, um, I believe it was May 20th of this year, uh, the Society of Jesus um, is officially celebrating and all its, um, all its partners are officially celebrating the 500th um, year after St. Ignatius was uh, wounded by a cannonball um, during the Battle of Pamplona. And uh, so 500 years ago, St. Ignatius, who back then uh, was obsessed with uh, his military career and this whole idea of gaining um, recognition, well, you know, has been referred to uh, time and again in his autobiography as vainglory, mm. um, completely enraptured him. And you know, it was really funny as I read, as I read the autobiography different times, just like his humanity just strikes me as, you know, it, it's quite dramatic, but very comedic in the fact that like everyone is telling him we should go. And he's like, no, I'm going to stay and defend the, <laughs> and, uh, defend um, the, the, the fort. And, um, and so, you know, it, it, even that tells so much about, you know, his desire to earn this recognition of valor um, by by his his uh, colleagues and and other anyway, so he stays and he gets terribly wounded um, by uh, a, a cannonball coming from the French side, and um, and you know it sets him in an entire path of. Uh, of recovery, a process of recovery that was very painful, not only physically, but also emotionally, because he had to let go of so many illusions that he had identified with as a person. Um, this whole idea of being this noble man um, that was, you know, in the service of the military that would uh, go to uh, an unnamed noble woman and um you know in a romantic gesture win her over and it was just a very painful process and and so his story is so human um and how he goes through that recovery process i think uh there's so many graces there for everyone mm -hmm. to learn from um I, I would say even regardless of your faith tradition, it's just such a human account of, of just detachment and, and what it means to really, you know, struggle with one's egos and illusions and just let go and let God work in your life. And so that's what we're celebrating. And it comes at a time where we are all, uh, we, we all have been faced with so many cannonball moments as as a world with this pandemic, as a nation with um, the pandemic, other pandemics like the racial uh, injustice, racial justice, racism, and everything that's related to that. And so many things that are just going on in our world. And so it comes at a time really so timely and relevant that we're celebrating this year. And I think um, we, I will, I will let you talk, but I think part of why we also wanted to do this is because we also realized as a university, you know, many of our colleagues have struggled so much in the past year with family responsibilities and work responsibilities and trying to be there for students um, while being emotionally and psychologically, uh, you know, just depleted. 
Um, and so I personally thought that this would be also a good time for us to enter into this type of conversation and invite others in our community uh, to see what graces might there be for them in walking with Ignatius through this year. Yeah, I, I love how you set that up. I, I mean, this is this is this is such an interesting thing about who he is. Saint Ignatius is. Um, he was very driven. He was a very driven person. And 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 uh, as we were getting ready for this, one of the things I did was I was curious. I was like, how old was Ignatius when he got hit by this cannonball? And so I just started looking at a timeline of his life. And um, one of the things that you know, I, I found is that it said he went in to become a soldier at the age of 15. And basically, uh, when he's hit by this cannonball, he's 30. You know, I mean, that's 15 years of of uh, dedicating himself to his career, mm -hmm. uh, his, his desires, his ambitions, um, his ego. Um, and then to be, to really find himself, um, unable to live out of that right because he was he was his leg was shattered by this cannonball and he's he's forced to recover um in you know to to go back home uh to his, his castle and to recover and through that recovery process uh, a very painful one physically for sure as his leg is broken and reset and um, but and also broken. <laughs> and, and again broken out of his, um, you know, his yeah. concern for the way his leg would have looked in his tights, um, <laughs> you know, but, but also one of, um, you know, you use the word detachment, um, and detaching from that sense, which is, I, I, I think when, when I think about him in this recovery, um, physically recovering from something takes a lot of work, right? But it, it changes the way you operate, you can get, move mobility, um, how you can find meaning, right? I mean, obviously couldn't be a soldier. He couldn't mm -hmm. do the things that fed his ego, that brought him glory, that uh, excited him. And here he is convalescing in a bed, recovering, um, without a lot of things like Netflix or, you know, <laughs> lots of books to just preoccupy his mind, he was really left to his own um, interior, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as he's sitting there, there's a lot of energy that goes into detaching, I think. Um, what does it mean to, um, to kind of, I, I just know in my own, this time, it, it's so easy to fill, you know, pick up my phone and, and, and pass a lot of time or check my email or respond to email and really preoccupy my mind. But, you know, if I go on retreat um, or when we go hiking and, and I just came off of a vacation and it takes me a while to detach, to let go of those things because I think I'm needed in them. And saying, how do I let go of them so I can be present to what I need to be present to, which is some rest, some repair, <laughs> um, some rejuvenation. Um, but also, how am I attentive to some silence in my life so I can actually pay attention to what's happening interiorly? And uh, as I think about Ignatius in this time, it's not an easy time to... Um, to feel like he can't do, because uh, I think he was a doer. He was someone who really was committed mm. to doing things. And um, I think being laid up in a bed where you're you're dealing with the physical pain of recovery, but also this um, searching, um, this how, who is he in this moment? He goes into this year of of really who is he in this moment? And I don't think that he chose, he wouldn't, I don't know if he would have chosen to do that if he hadn't been hit by a cannonball. And I think for, for so many of us, those are some of the questions that might be coming up is who am I in this, mm. in this moment? Who am I in this pandemic? Who am I in the context of this, the United States and our loyal community, um, in our families, you know, who am I in this? So, for me, I think there's a lot about this Ignatian year that really opens up the opportunity for us to to pause, 
um, with Ignatius. Now I know none of us are getting uh, a year off to mm. <laughs> to um, really spend that time reflecting on that. But how might we create space in this year to be intentional in this Ignatian year to really journey with Ignatius in in maybe finding some time to convalesce ourselves um, and in that give ourselves the freedom to detach from what preoccupies us and pay attention um, to what excites us, what concerns us, um, what frustrates us, what gives us hope. You know, and I think that's why the 19th annotation, um, the spiritual exercises for everyday life, is such a powerful um, way of, of walking in in this um, Ignatian spirituality because you know if you are always waiting for the perfect week of tranquility mm. to do the work or for the you know day of perfect silence where no one will disturb you especially you know us in our reality of parents and uh, partners to other human beings <laughs> um, that's just never going to happen. <laughs> um, and so the beauty of, of, of the 19th annotation is how do you make it a priority to, to yourself and your relationship with God to make that time in your busy life? Uh, because this is just necessary work for that healing. Um, and I was thinking about this as we were preparing for this conversation. There's always a need for healing because that's just life right there's never a point where you will come in that we were like perfectly you know it, it, un unscathed you know uh there's always something that we need to be healing um and so this is always necessary work and so finding a way to make that time uh for your relationship with god and and yourself is, is so crucial there was I was listening to this podcast um, from the Jesuits at Canada and U.S. conference um, AMDG and uh, Jim Martin was quoted they were doing a legacy on on Father Bill Barry um, as you know and his uh, spiritual uh, as a spiritual director and um, he quoted a line by Father Richard Leonard, which is, if God seems distant, guess who moved, right? And it's just like the idea, well, they were talking a lot about Bill Berry and his whole idea of God inviting us into a relationship and how we should think of that as a friendship and that we're active participants in our story. And that's mm. how God wants us to be. And but that that story means you have to take the time to make it a priority in your life. And for me personally, um, going into Ignatian spirituality has been a very effective way of healing. And the way that I started into this, I, had to, I, I was pregnant with my first uh, child and um, I started the 19th annotation retreat when I came out from the hospital mm -hmm. and I really needed it. Uh, I, I have struggled with motherhood so much, but I struggled most in those first nine months after giving birth. And I have so much to thank uh, to this uh, whole, you know, toolkit, if you may, um, and, and, you know, I, and I just, for me, it has been very healing. So I think this is a great way to, to offer some gifts and tools uh, that may serve for others who are looking for healing at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And, and I love, you know, the, the fact that you're talking about the 19th annotation and spiritual exercises, which just, you know, people might not know, understand what that means. And, the spiritual exercises is is, um, is a framework um, that Ignatius wrote, and he and he began this before he was a priest, um, and he and he began this in his own search for really wanting to 
to live a life that pointed more directly towards God. And for him, um, that meant paying attention to where is God in the world, right? And he believed that that the whole person helps to un, to know God. And, and so I love that idea of if if God feels distance, it wasn't God that moved. Um, it's this idea of, you know, what what has maybe gotten in the way for me of knowing God or recognizing God. And, and for me, it could be as simple as if I don't start my morning by taking some time to kind of center myself, if I just kind of jump into the day and start moving from thing to thing to thing to thing, um, versus if, how can I intentionally walk across campus and instead of rushing across campus to, to look and to see the person before me as a possibility of who is this person rather than like they're in my way and I've got to get through them to where I'm going next. And, um, but Ignatius, really, the, the exercises were created as an opportunity for people to first know how much they're loved by God, mm -hmm. right? And it's, that's the starting place for Ignatius is knowing how much we are loved by God. And once we understand how much we're loved by God, then we can start to move forward. And for Ignatius, the, the next step is going forward and looking at the brokenness within ourselves and within the world. Um, and I thought that was a really beautiful thing is that that's that Ignatius, the, the, the pre-step before even looking at brokenness is love. And so that when we go and we do look at the brokenness in ourselves or in the world, how can we have a loving lens to approach that? And then the exercises, as you know, move into um, the life of Christ, understanding who Jesus was and the way that he lived and the way he engaged and the way he cared and challenged um, and called people to remove the barriers that, that, from their lives or from society that kept people from God's love and the fulfillment of God's love in their life or in the world. And, and then of course it moves through the, the, um, crucifixion and death of, of Jesus and, and then looks at the resurrection. And through that time, we look at where we are called to offer our loving response. And so I, I, I think for Ignatius, at least the way I've, I've read it, I've heard other people talk about it, is the exercises are a process. It's a love story um, for knowing that we come from love, that we are sustained in love, and that we are capable of responding with love. And so I think, you know, what does the exercises offer? What has it offered me? It's, it's more of a loving lens towards myself and towards mm -hmm. others. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what this Ignatian year has the potential to offer us is to, um, greater love towards ourselves and towards our family, our friends, our community, our world, um, as well as helping us to discern what that loving response might look like. Yeah. I, you know, when you said that about, um, the brokenness, I am reminded, um, I told you, I, well, I ordered and I sent you a copy of, of Walking with Ignatius um, by Father Arturo Sosa, who's the general, superior general of the Society of Jesus. And there are so many great things that I have written down every time I hear him talk. You know, I could be because, you know, maybe because he's from Venezuela, I'm from Puerto Rico. There's, there are some shared idiosyncrasies, um, but like he talks about Sancocho and, and I understand that analogy very well. You know, Sancocho is this, uh, you know, in Venezuela, they have their own uh, style. In Puerto Rico, we have our own style, but it's something that needs to be seeped in with time. Like you put mm -hmm. in the Sancochos, I guess, too, mm -hmm. but every part needs to be allowed to simmer and cook and, and, and get its own just So it's a, it's a long-term process. And I was listening to him uh, in the book launch um, for his book, uh, he was talking about, well, first of all, that whole idea, we, that recovery of any kind, healing, true transformation. Oh, he talks a lot about the finding of true freedom, right? How this, how Ignatius entire uh, life testimonies about the process of finding true freedom in God, right? 
that this is not something that you can just order that doesn't happen mm -hmm. magically that you cannot lose 15 pounds in one week right this is something that you know takes time and you need to give it space and you need to give it silence and you need to give it the pauses that are necessary for it to to happen for the holy spirit to come in for the grace um to be revealed but he also says something that i thought was brilliant and it is obvious it's obviously been there all the time but i had not paid attention to it which is you know after his multiple surgeries uh one to 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 help save him and the second one because of vanity um you know he always stayed with his right leg i believe it was his right leg shorter than his left leg so he limped um throughout his life and uh and he's saying what a beautiful paradox. Mm -hmm. This is someone who started walking when he was painfully limping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did um, El Camino, I did the Camino de Santiago um, in 2013. And I remember my then boyfriend, now husband, and I, we both trained with our walking stick and we broke in our boots. We did everything the book said. You have to, you know, take your backpack and your walking stick, your boots and train for several weeks before you head out into El Camino, blah, blah, blah. You know, you want to be in top shape. <laughs> and so this is someone who is so determined and so um, yeah, just determined to show his love and dedication to God that he starts when he's at his worst limping yeah. you know um mm -hmm. and so i was taken by that because you know it, it's obviously there but i just had not you know so much of ignatian spirituality is about imagining the details of the scene mm. and i had not imagined that detail about what it means to walk such a long painful walk while also limping um and anyway i just thought that you know that was a great a great focus of attention. I found there's a very beautiful short film. Um, I wrote down the name of, of the Jesuit, Shamika Nipun. Um, it's called A Limping Pilgrim, The Last Days of St. Ignatius, and it's on YouTube. And it's I think it's a Jesuit global production, but um, it opens to just about, I don't know, three or four minutes of just focusing on his feet as he limps by walking. And it's just a very, you know, Father Sosa says it, it's a beautiful paradox. And I just, I just thought that it, it was just brilliant. And, and when we are talking about how do we, you know, we start another academic year soon and many of us are still feeling exhausted from, you know, the last year and, and now more challenges may be coming up. You know, we may be asked to do more things, things that we're not comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. And we're not in top shape by any means. If anything, we're all limping. <laughs> and so how do we start this academic year being there for our students when we are limping? Yeah, that so. is great. Um, that, that is a very helpful image. <laughs> for me as I think about this because I always I actually I actually joke when when people are talking and when we're talking about the spiritual exercises and I think it's so appropriately named spiritual exercise because I always said it's like um as someone who's always struggled with my uh, you know my weight fluctuates depending on the time of year and how active I am and you know but it, it's like I've never been a runner, uh, I've played sports, but just running for running sake, I never was a runner. And, um, my wife, Shannon got into running half marathons and, and she encouraged me to do a marathon and I just, a half marathon. And I thought, Oh my God, how am I ever going to run that far? Right. But, um, you know, I started with an app that started me out. You'd run for a little bit and then you'd walk for a little bit and then you'd run for a little more and then you'd walk, you, you know, you'd, it would trade off. Right. So, uh, when I think about this and I think about the story of Ignatius and I think about the spiritual exercises, it's kind of that way, you know, it's not like we don't have to be running the full marathon before we start. Um, matter of fact, maybe we're not being called to run. Um, I think we're actually being called to walk, right? So it's, 
um, in this process of the exercises, in this process of entering into the Ignatian year, um, it's come as you are. And Ignatius set that from the beginning, um, as you said, with the limp. And I, and I think about, um, as we do begin this year, many of us are walking with that limp. I think that's a great way to yeah. talk about this year and how we go. And yet, we're not called. We're not being called to run. We're being called to walk, right? And and maybe even um, going back to what I was saying earlier about walking across campus. If I'm moving too quickly, I'm not paying attention, right? And obviously, um, you know, if you have a painful limp and you're walking across mm -hmm. campus, that that's if you've ever done that, you know, I mean, hurt your ankle or anything like that. You that that draws your attention, right? Um, but how do we how do we bring who we are and i think that's what we're called to is bringing who we are into this moment um and paying attention and you know ignatius throughout his life um i think especially in those early years when he was living in a cave in manresa um you know he he went to some dark times of you know feeling like who is he in this what is he called to? Is he capable of things? You know, so I think as we go into this, there's something about Ignatius' story that I, I think it's very accessible. Um, and I think that's the word that I offer people is it's very accessible, his life story. Now, is everything going to uh, align or m be meaningful for, a, for an individual? Probably not. But I, I think there is something about him because he is so human. And I think because of he him recognizing how important that humanity is in understanding himself and the world and god um it does he does open he provides us with this very wide door for entering into this spirituality and reflecting on um who we are and who mm -hmm. we hope to become and you mentioned i mean this whole slowing down and paying attention i was reading that there was a research study, can't, uh, don't really have the citation in front of me, but um, that showed that, you know, we really didn't slow down during the pandemic. Most people ended up doing way more work um, that they had done pre-pandemic. And so somewhere along the line, the lesson has not still been learned. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's a lesson there about slowing down um, our colleague, uh, I'm gonna shout out his name, Billy Freeville from Fine Arts. He um, shared a title called The Slow Professor. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the midst of reading that book and trying to learn because one of the things that I do when I come into the classroom is I feel this, this stress to occupy every single time with my students with talk. Mm -hmm. Something has to be said, something has to be imparted, something has to be lectured or 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 what. And it is a complete, you know, struggle against that. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. And you, and I think that's the spiritual conversation, the concept of a spiritual conversation, that methodology, I think is so powerful, even for application within the classroom, about just giving and having some pauses and some silences, you know, and letting students, students may be uncomfortable in silence, but I think one of the things that as a society, and, and even, especially when you're younger, we need to, to, you know, help them come into terms with that silence and sit with that silence and, and be themselves you know, in that silence. And so I'm trying to really, I mean, I have to rewire my brain incredibly to, to you know, work against that knee jerk um, instinct of just wanting to feel every single moment of the class time with words. Um, part two. I love about that. You, you know, you talked about the steeping, which I think is really important right um and especially in discernment uh, you know i i often want to just rush to the end right um and there's that beautiful prayer that talks about the slow work of god and you know we're all naturally impatient right because uh you know i can go online and uh with 
and order groceries and within two hours they can show up at my door um so why why can't i um know that this is something I want and why can't I get it to actually become a pattern in my life more quickly right that's and that's hard to do um, there was a, a I believe a neurologist out of Seattle who talked about um, our brains and our brains are like records um, and in the sense that you know we've got these ingrained patterns in us and when um, when X happens you know the the needle would drop into track three on the record and we'd automatically respond with track three um, <laughs> and he would talk about the idea that if we're creating a new pattern it's like trying to wear a new groove on a record um and if you if anyone had a record player um i think they're coming back it's actually pretty fashionable to have records again but you know thinking about trying to press a needle to create a new groove is very hard and it's very time intensive um, to create that new pattern within us. So I, I think sometimes, you know, we just think, oh, well, I know for me, I, I, sometimes for me, I, I might come to this insight and I'll want something and I'll say, this is how it makes sense. This is what I should be doing. And yet my pattern is, uh, my pattern, I fall back into my old pattern so quickly. And I think that's what slowing down mm -hmm. does for us. And I think that's what Ignatius calls us to do. You know, he, he would call us to multiple times throughout the day to, to examine our lives and, and to look and say, oh, what is the pattern? Is this a new pattern? Is this a healthy pattern? Um, and, and, you know, and so some of that time of just, I think that's some of the steeping is even paying attention to what is giving me life in this moment and what is really you know, frustrating me or binding me up or, um, you know, uh, some of the words like, what gives you joy? What excites you? What, you know, what, what brings you life? And what is life draining? Um, so as we think about that, what am I being steeped in? <laughs> I think is always an interesting thing. Am I being steeped in experiences, relationships, um, work that brings me joy, um, that excites mm -hmm. me? Um, or are some of these, some of these things and, um, even people maybe, um, life draining for me. So, uh, you know, and, and like I said, you, you, if you slow down enough, if we can slow down enough to pay attention to actually what's behind what I'm feeling, I might know on a daily basis, like I just, today's not a good day. I don't feel my energy's low. I'm not excited about this. I'm actually dreading it, but do I know what, what, what about that day? Am I paying attention to what it is about that experience that's leading to that, that, that relationship? And, um, I was trying to look up, there's, there's a, I think a theologian, I can't remember who wrote the book, but it's called three mile an hour God. And, and the reason they, the title is three mile an hour God is because I believe that, um, three miles an hour is the average walking pace of a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. And the idea was that much like Ignatius, you have to slow down and, and pay attention to what's happening in the day and what's before you and the way that God is is presenting opportunities for us um, to respond. So, uh, I was reading um, our, our friend June Ellis um, suggested a title, uh, Richard Rohr's The Wisdom Pattern, which I think was published this year. And... Um, he talks about, uh, you know, order, disorder, and reorder. And he talks about the importance of having a positive vision mm -hmm. that will then guide you in that third important phase of reordering. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so many things come to mind with what you said. We need to slow down. But then I think what Ignatius does, it, he is inviting us, well, Christ through Ignatius, God through Ignatius is inviting us after slowing down to then what are the habits and what is the discipline that will make sure we continue those good, those graces that have been offered to us in that time of recovery or that time of, of disorder and chaos. And I think that there's a great, 
project coming out of uh, Morgan State called the Good Life Project. And, and part of that project has to do what good habits have you discovered or started uh, in getting invested in through the pandemic that you want to make sure stay in place long after and then what is your plan to make that happen and I think you know so much about Ignatian spirituality is about okay once you have gone in there into that slow process of paying attention then you have the examine prayer right it's things that you do on an everyday basis that is that, that keep that habit going that you have to have some discipline um, you cannot just expect oh the grace is here thank you so much God now whatever right you have to okay i take it and i take it as a gift and i seriously you know with intention accept it into my life and i will honor that and so i think i think that there's a lot of things happening and and you know clearly this pandemic is not going away anytime soon um so you know what else do we need to do what what else with this time are we you know, considering grappling with, struggling with, still needs more fixing. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the slow, slowing down of of humanity that this is requiring us of us gives us more time to to really, I think, continue uh, learning, going deeper, trying to understand more of what we're asked to do. I wanted to uh, share some words from um, Margaret Frigi, uh, who is the provost um, at the College of the Holy Cross. She spoke as part of the AJCU National Justice Conference this summer. And her words, I think, you know, as a faculty member, um, I took them uh, to heart and um, one of the things that she says, you know, what are we being called to do as a faculty? Uh, she referenced the um, universal apostolic preference of journeying with youth uh, to create a hope-filled future. And, you know, as faculty members, as we're starting this uh, academic year, you know, there's so much that we are being asked of to do at every single level of our being, um, for those who, of us who are parents, as parents, uh, uh, if we have a partner, um, as partner, um, you know, as faculty members, as members of the Loyola community, as members of our own communities and neighborhoods. And uh, she said, you know, just an emphasis on we're asked to accompany our students right and that doesn't mean necessarily to be lecturing at them it doesn't mean to be instructing them or leading them or creating for them it means to accompany them and the words that she used were so beautiful um which is maybe what we are being asked to do is just to show them that they're loved that they're beloved and and you have mentioned the spiritual exercises and that whole first week of just understanding that love's uncon uh, god's unconditional love for you and and you know if you think about it you know what more can we offer our students i mean that i think i don't think there's we can impart all the knowledge that we have acquired through our careers from books from studies um but love, I mean, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, a, a, sorry, I was just trying to, as you said this, as you were talking, and I love this about being in conversation because I feel like every time we're in conversation, Bala, I'm like, my brain is just exploding <laughs> ideas and connections as you're talking because I'm like, oh my gosh. That, um, but there is a, a, and I was just trying to think, um, Frederick uh, Beekner um, once said, the place where your deep gladness and the world's hunger meet, right, is what we're called to in vocation. And I think that so often in our lives, we end up encountering our students who, who come in and they have this deep hunger, right? And they're, and not just our students, I think it's, I find it in myself, mm -hmm. I think in the 
conversations I have with faculty, administrators, staff, alums, community members, that there is this deep hunger, right, of, of wanting to do good in the world, to wanting to be of use and of service in the world, to make a difference. And, and how we do that, um, often, you know, we're asking the question also at the same time that we're, we're experiencing these um, tremendous injustices in our world, whether they're historical, um, systematic, um, or something we experience in a relationship, right? And, and when we're experiencing those things, uh, how do we have a loving response? That's a hard thing to do to uh, injustice. How do we respond? You know, I mean, that's one of the questions. It's, it's one thing to say about speaking about responding to injustice with love from mm -hmm. a distant, right? But when that injustice is something that you, an individual, encounters, that's, that's a hard place to come from and to say, oh, yes, I am, I am, there's, this is an inequitable situation, so I should respond with love that good luck that's a tough thing mm -hmm. that's a tough thing i don't understand how to do that but i also think that as you're talking about the busyness and all the temptation right there's so much out there um the other quote that popped up is uh Par parker palmer um who is someone else that i've enjoyed reading and following for so long he he talks about this in the sense that um vocation means never that you always start with the self and move towards what the world needs and i think sometimes that feels selfish right oh i'm going to start with me and then move toward the out, out towards the world but he says this and i think it's important he follows this up and he says because wisely vocation begins not in what the world needs which is everything hmm. but in the nature of the human self in what brings the self joy the deep joy of knowing that we are here on earth to be the gifts that God created. And I think that's an important thing because, you know, as we think about what does, kind of going back to what we started with in this pen, you know, like where we find ourselves in this world, there's so much that competes for our attention. And there's so many, so many needs. And you, we can't simply respond to everything. Um, and I think that's, we, we find ourselves trying to do that. Um, I, I, I will say, I find myself doing that. I find myself very much responding to the, the next crisis that's coming up and being highlighted in the news or, um, and being very upset about it because I, these are tremendous injustices that we, we read about, mm -hmm. we experience, we see, we live with. Um, but there's a lot of them. Um, but, and, and, and I'll say, it's easy to lose ourselves in that of constantly chasing um, one injustice, one need to the next need, to the next need, to the next need. And I think some of this means that we have to start with understanding who we are and what we have to offer. And I think sometimes actually we get in more, we create uh, more problems when we rush in to try and solve an issue that maybe we don't even have a full understanding of except for the fact that this is broken and it's causing pain and how do I go in you know what is my role to even go into this who's already addressing it who do I need to be in conversation with who are the companions which I think is also another um, important lesson from the life of Ignatius he didn't just do this as an mm -hmm. individual he did this in relationship, right? He did this in community, um, and not always perfect, <laughs> not not perfectly, um, but he was someone who who did this in relationships, through relationships, through the the initial relationships with the um, men he would go on to found the Society of Jesus with, but also with many um, um, people who who cared for him, uh, who fed him, who took him in, who walked with him, who he was in spiritual direction with, who were friends of his. So I think that there's some of this as we think about um, we're walking, uh, we might be limping, um, but we don't need to do that on our own either. 
right? So how can we be companions? Like uh, you've you've always been a tremendous companion for me here at Loyola in 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 dialogue and relationship and faith and thinking about the work we do um, and so many other folks. Uh, you know, that's one of the things I love about our Loyola community is mm -hmm. there are so many people who do look at the world. Uh, through a lens of vocation, through a lens, uh, a loving lens to respond to the brokenness in our yeah. world and to forming, you know, themselves and others to actually respond uh, to those, those gaps in our world. So yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I hope maybe this year um, as a community, we're able to figure out there are so many amazing individuals on our campus it, at all different levels and you know th th that whole busyness going from meeting to meeting which now may be on zoom mm -hmm. um you know all of those things are taking time away from the actual type of conversations and engagement that really you know are meaningful as human beings and where we can really build and bond as a community and heal and I hope and, and and they don't necessarily maybe they shouldn't even be like official programmatic offerings rather just a space for people like you and I to do th things like this and come together and continue our friendship now in this way um, but for so many other people so I hope they there there is a way for them to find. I will, the last thing I will say is I, I was very lucky and so grateful for the opportunity to go to the Ignatian Colleagues Program um, orientation this past July. And um, one of the things about that program, well, it's just, it's just amazing. But one thing we did one day was we did a case study and the case study had to do with uh, you know, a form of inequity um, in a campus setting. And I learned a lot about the process and how it went is you were giving a case study in the morning, you know, everything is condensed because of timing restrictions, COVID, everything, but we did it in one day, you were given the case study in the morning. Um, and so we had, we read the case study as a group, we had time to talk about it, deliberate about it, and then we put it down. Mm -hmm. And then we all went to lunch and we had a break. And in the middle of all that, conversations happen. There's a chance for people to connect at a human level. Maybe you're talking about each other, about your, you know, your kids or your spouse or some issues you've had. And that completely can trigger, you know, an insight that, you know, everything you had already in mind for the case study is scratched. And you're like, oh my God, I was seeing this completely in the wrong way. Like, look at this new piece of information. And one thing that we all took as a group is that every individual in that table had a personal story and a lived experience that brought something important to our understanding of that case study and how we come about making decisions. And I think one of the things, you know, sometimes in the, in the classroom, it, some people might not consider it appropriate or outside the scope of classroom work, but allowing students to bring in their lived experiences is so important because those are teachable moments for us as faculty and for the other students. So I think, you know, that whole idea of, of, of process and how we arrive at decisions and let it letting things sit and giving space for human one-on-one -on -one conversations that might bring up new insights that we had not even considered in our uh, you know deliberation I think that's just that very Ignatian way of approaching decision making is also crucial as we move on through this year and everything um, that lies in store for us. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I, I think, you know, I, I think actually the one of the dangers um, of, of 
just personal discernment. Uh, and this is why I think it's so important in our, in our discernment, in our individual discernments, is that we are, you know, Ignatius encouraged people to, to be accompanied by um, spiritually mature uh, someone who's more mature spiritually than than the individual, right? So, but I, I think for that, that that could be, you know, that could be mentors, it's faculty members, it's administrator staff, uh, church, you know, your ministers, um, coaches, you know, there's so many different people that we bring into our lives who can help us in our discernment. And they're actually ne so necessary because I think sometimes you know, we could look at a case study or a situation before us and say, oh, well, you know, I've discerned that this is what needs to happen. And mm -hmm. I think actually that can lead actually, that could lead to um, sometimes not having the full understanding of a context. And if we don't have the full understanding of the context, which I, which I know I find myself in a lot, I come into a room and I think, oh, I've thought through this process and, and here's the problem. And here's three different things we can do. And then I sit in the room and I hear from another colleague who says, oh, and actually uh, this has been happening in this department for X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. And, you know, this is the experience of these three other people. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so it's, it is so important for us um, to also recognize that discernment isn't a one and done, you know, um, one, it's, it's, discernment is always happening, which I think is something that early on, I remember thinking, oh, discernment are these big moments in my life. Um, and that's, that's true that there are these big movements and these um, discernment that I'm doing. But even as I'm paying attention to um, the community and the relationships I'm in, and, um, you know, I, sometimes I, I, I get it. I, I do well with it. And sometimes I just miss the mark. And I think that's the other thing about this process that I find hopeful is that Ignatius even saw that in this, this whole process, his discernment process, because once you make your discernment and you, you move towards action, that action isn't the last step. It's evaluation, you know? So then Ignatius constantly is asking mm -hmm. us to look back and say, is what I just did, how did that work out? Well, it seems like there were some unhappy people. Well, well now I have to go back and find out why maybe people were unhappy about that because maybe I missed something in, my, in this process of discernment um, for knowing what I'm called to, how I'm called to have a loving response in the world, you know? So I, I, I think this is an ongoing process it's cyclical in a sense that it you know you you were always being called to it and i think it's helpful in that sense i i find hope in that in a sense because i also feel like oh there's an always an opportunity to come back it's not it's not it's not as if it just closes the door it's oftentimes that i'm called to uh, revisit something um, or to know that that was one step. And now where am I being called to in the next step? Where's, where's God inviting me to? What is the community inviting me to do um, in that next step? So for me, there's so much about this Ignatian spirituality that um, is accessible. Um, I think it's relevant. Um, and I know, you know, I, I, I've been raised a lifelong Catholic. And so for me, the spirituality um, aligns very deeply with my faith and that's the way I, I approach it but I also know that I've, I've um, I work with a lot of people who faith is not uh, a primary lens and they have found so much uh, about this Jesuit uh, you know tradition and the life of Ignatius to be very inviting for them and um, and I have I've learned from my colleagues and friends from other faith traditions who have come to know Ignatius and actually have, you know, who, who come with a different lens, uh, other than the primary lens of, mm -hmm. that I have, um, and, and offer such, uh, such wisdom and insight into who Ignatius is. And so I think, and I think that's the beauty of this is that each of us come with our own identities and lenses and experience um, and, uh, that's the beauty of 
looking for God everywhere is that mm -hmm. each of us are standing in different places and can can reveal God in different ways and reveal God's love in in such different ways. So um, I have really been enjoying our conversation. Uh, I, I hope that others will enjoy this conversation. <laughs> Um, and I really am looking forward to the opportunity to have other people join us throughout the year as we go as we go forward. Yeah, we'll we we'll definitely will have some people come in and invite them into a spiritual conversation um, to learn from their own lived experiences and understandings of Ignatian spirituality. But do you have some reflection questions, Sean, that you wanted to uh, share before we close? I do. I, and, and I do, I, I think, you know, as we were talking, um, about this, these conversations, um, we felt it was very important, right. To offer people and very Ignatian to offer people some reflection questions. Now, throughout these conversations, um, your questions might be very different than the ones we offer. And that is perfectly, that's great actually, because, um, where is God leading you in these conversations? It's not for us to tell you, um, but uh, but we do have some questions that we thought we would offer, and there's some just kind of very broad questions, and uh, we invite you to spend a little time with it, um, to steep, uh, to let them steep with you this conversation. Uh, if there's something that came up for you in this conversation, if there was a phrase, a question, a comment um, that you you thought hmm that struck that stood out for me pay attention to that that's worth that's worth paying attention to uh as well as if there's something that you know you went oh that didn't sit right you know uh well pay attention to that too is that something you need to pay attention to is it something you need to just move on from uh is it something that you want to offer back to us um you know either where you have found something some insight uh you found more questions uh, or you found um, something that was challenging for you. So um, just take and I offer you, we're, we're going to offer you these just a couple of questions. And uh, the first is, um, what was the fruit of this conversation for you today? So what, what kind of came forward for you? What, what brought you life? What excited you? What brought you joy? Um, what, what tickled your imagination? What is the fruit of this conversation, this time together? The other uh, question we might say is uh, kind of what I talked about at the beginning is, is what, what consoles you? What consoled you from this conversation? Is there something that you heard that, that you needed to hear today? Is there something in this conversation that was difficult? Um, did something in the conversation touch a place within you that um, maybe you need to look at? You know, maybe it's a conversation about where we're at in this pandemic. Maybe it's an image. Um, Paula offered these great images of Ignatius limping and maybe there's something about that image that that struck you um, or a conversation or a question that came up a story and as ignatius always reminds us we always look forward with hope so as you think about the year ahead or the week ahead or this day <laughs> what is it you need to move forward with hope is there something in this conversation that gave you hope? Is there something that you want to explore around the idea of hope? And of course, where is it that God was speaking to you today? And by that, we mean, what is it that that sits with you and you might not know that right away it might come from taking a walk later <laughs> or when you lay down or you sit in your chair and it tickles your brain a little bit it says yeah what was that that was an interesting quote or hmm, how am i approaching this as i enter into the year so um, pay attention to those questions and, and i would also say that one of the things you i would offer you to do is to write it down 
um, and to come back to those questions. It's, a, it's it, Ignatius would say repetition, repetition, repetition. So um, look for the patterns. What are the questions that are popping up for you? What's the question that sticks with you all week uh, or all day? So I think I would like to offer a very short uh, prayer that I not there's it wasn't in the um actual film but it's from words that uh you know the character uh that's playing saint ignatius says it's from that short film that i mentioned earlier limping pilgrim the last days of saint ignatius by shami kanipun sj lord through your mercy set me free from my illusions and purify my attachments so that I may experience true freedom to live. And with that, I think we've come to the end, Sean. Thank you so much for making this happen.